All right, guys, it's the last week of the semester, and this week we are talking about global media. And one of the big things about global media is global journalism and how that plays a part in um, not only how we as Americans see our news about what's going on, but how others see us as well. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about international journalism, um, some things that you should know as media professionals going in about media around the world, and kind of just open your eyes a little bit to um, what you could be looking at um, besides just here in American News. Uh, you can also take classes um, on global media or international media here in our college if this interests you. So uh, let's take a look. So when we talk about international journalism or global media, one of the things that comes to play is globalization. And globalization is basically um, how politics, economics, trade, finance, lifestyle, and culture all come together um, and interact with each other across different continents. Um, and so it could mean, you know, America is a melting pot of culture, right, or lifestyles. Um, you could think of globalization when it comes to um, economic trade across different countries or what kind of politics we deal with and um, how they in interact with each other. So as we go through this unit, I want you to think of what is your definition of globalization um, and what are some examples that you can think of that um, are current and are in the news right now when it comes to globalization. One of the things that you have to think about with international media or global media is that we in the U.S. tend to live in a tiny bubble of information. Yes, we find out news from other countries, but when you think about it, we really just like to stay in our own little realm and what's going on in the U.S. And, and that's, you know, fair, right? That's where we live. But there's so many things in the world that impact us on a daily level from around the world that um, if you don't dwell into international journalism um, and news around the world from other outlets, you may be missing out on some things that are happening or some viewpoints that could help you understand things. And so I liked this quote by Stephen Hess. It says, our society is awash in specialized information, including foreign news, available to those who have the time, interest, money, and education to take advantage of it. Do you agree or disagree? And when I say, do you agree or disagree, do you agree that people that have the interest, money, and time to look through international news and really dwell into it, do it? Or do you think that everyone kind of just forgets about it and goes on with their life? Global media is really important because even though there are a million different languages and a array of ways that you could tell the news um, or you know talk about the news most news media even in other countries have copied western style media in how they do their news broadcasts or their newspapers and so western media um so the u.s and um Europe have had a really big impact on the world when it comes to um, how we share media and what media is to them. Um, and they also consume a lot of Western media. Um, Rutgers uh, is the biggest and most well known of the international news and video um, for television, and it serves about 409 customers in 83 countries. Um, and even though they serve all of these different countries and they are like a hub for international news, um, you have to really think like, is that okay? Is it okay for a Western dominated media source to be like the hub for international news? Because that sways how we see what's going on in the world, right? Because we're putting a Western spin on it and we may not understand culture and custom and language that is important to different countries. Dan Rather, who is a well-renowned journalist, um, was talking to Harvard students one time and he said, don't kid yourself. The trend line in American journalism is away from 
not toward increased foreign coverage. And really, that's just saying, you know, we don't really take the time to talk about what's going on in other countries. Yes, if something like Russia invading Ukraine happens where it's going to impact us in some way, we're going to talk about it. But, you know, smaller invasions or political disputes or things that are going on don't always make American news because it's not necessarily inherent for us to know. But the more that you know about what's going on in the world, the better well-rounded you are and the better you can make informed decisions. So do you feel that it's a good thing or a bad thing that we don't always have increased foreign news coverage? And do you think other countries feel this way or not? And I'm going to tell you that other countries don't feel this way. Uh, when you go to international news sites, most of the time they will have a dedicated U.S. tab that tells you everything you need to know about America that doesn't happen over here for other big countries. So it's something to think about. One of the big things that has an impact on not only uh, American news and international news and globalization as a whole um, is called the CNN effect. And basically, this was when we um, really started seeing what we know as of news now, um, this 24-hour international news cycle. It really started during the late Cold War period um, into the Gulf War. And then after 9-11, um, it really hit and we got this idea that, you know, we have to have news right now, all the time, ongoing, at the touch of our fingertips, um, and, it, and news organizations have to be the first and the fastest to get information out. And this is um, called the CNN effect. And basically, um, it's when there's any type of event coverage um, that is huge around the globe that we're going to be covering it. Um, and then how the U.S. is strongly influenced in that. Um, when it comes to the effect, uh, you can see that it impacts not only, um, you know, big historical events, but it can also impact things like natural disasters and how we see them. So sometimes we don't see them as, oh my gosh, like these people are devastated, but just as a way of saying, oh, it's another natural disaster. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes it's like, oh, this is a huge thing. We need to donate. Um, we need to um, give resources. And so sometimes it has a good effect and sometimes it doesn't. With any type of news, we're going to always have some sort of fake news. And when it comes to the global media aspect of it, you have to really think about the environment in which you're reading, um, who you are reading the news from, um, and what you're reading about. Because sometimes personal beliefs um, or government instituted um, demands are put into the news or information is left out to the audience. And so we have to really think about who is telling us what is the public opinion and um, how does that influence the news? And that goes for, you're talking about American news, Russian news, um, Asian news, anything. Um, and then we have what's called post-truth. And this is basically, um, a period or concept that really talks about um, public anxiety about truth and who is a legitimate truth teller and what news source is telling the truth. And so fake news and post-truth kind of goes together. And in this um, worldwide media web that we have, you have to really go through and look at different sources and how they're saying the same thing in different ways and who's telling the truth and what truth do you believe? So why is all of this important? You're like, okay, yeah, I should look at global news. I got it, get off your soapbox. But the thing is, is that global news is just not a single report. Like you're not gonna just hear, oh, there was a, you know, a tsunami in Puerto Rico. Um, Russia has invaded Ukraine, those kinds of things. 
uh, it, it's a process, right? We have to constantly be updating and checking international news and seeing what's going on around the world. Because again, you're only going to hear the big things that happening that are happening, not necessarily all the little things that lead up to it. Um, so one of the things that I do when I teach global journalism is I have my students go and read international news from different sites. And um, when they do that, the feedback that I get is like, wow, I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know the, you know, didn't know about all these different sites. And um, sometimes new news mediums or new sites become their go-to. My go-to or my favorite medium to receive news is from BBC because I feel like it's one of the least biased when it comes to Western media. Um, and usually I can go to it and compare it to American news or um, like the Russian Times or the South uh, China South Morning Post um, and kind of see where the truth lies in that. But other people, you know, it could be different things for different people. And so it's good to have like the sources that you go to to kind of check these things. When it comes to global media, one of the things that you have to talk about is <clears throat> censorship and press freedom. So we talked a little bit a few weeks ago about America having the First Amendment and the right to free press and free speech. And although we have that, um, We'll talk here in a minute about where we rank on the most censored and free countries in the world. But uh, there are 10 countries that are highly censored. Um, and this goes back and forth and changes every year or so. But these 10 are usually the top 10 of the most censored. And that's Eritrea, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia. Um, Azerbaijan, Vietnam, Iran, China, Myanmar, and Cuba. And we're gonna talk a little bit about them. So who decides who's the most um, censored? Uh, well, the um, World Press Freedom Index comes out every year um, and they rank the uh, press freedom for each country um, for 181 countries, I believe, um, depending on different things. So it could be politics. Um, it can be about, you know, uh, freedom in general, uh, things that you can do other than free speech, lots of different things that go into it. You can go to their website, they list all the things that go into their ranking. Um, but Reporters Without Borders is who... Um, talks about this uh so it's been published every year since 2002 um it is an advocacy tool basically just to kind of let people know what's going on in the world um and it's a point of reference for all sorts of media um and diplomats and um different entities to kind of say hey look at what we're doing really great and what should we be working on um, oh, it ranks 180 countries and regions, um, and they look at pluralism, independence of the media, the quality of legislative framework, the safety of journalists, so on and so forth. Um, it doesn't rank public policy per se, so like it looks at the government and its framework, but not like exactly each thing that they are putting into law or taking out of law. Um, and it is not an indicator for the quality of journalism. So this is what each of those things stands for. So you have pluralism, um, which measures the degree to which opinions are represented in the media. So do lots of people have the ability to give opinion? Uh, media independence. So um, are media entities able to function independently? Um, outside of any political or gov government or business or religious power. Uh, environment and self-censorship, basically uh, the environment in which news and information is provided and how it operates. Then you have transparency um, of the institution, like how are they giving information? Are they um, truthful about it? Are they letting you see kind of behind the curtain? 
the infrastructure of the news media. So the type of production that they have, the information that they have. Um, and then is there any violence against journalists uh, that go into this calculation? Abuses, of course, the level of ab abuse and violence towards media and media professionals. So I wanted to take a look at um, some of the most censored countries this year and tell you a little bit about what's going on in those countries. So um, America is actually listed in the 40s, if I remember correctly, the last time I looked at um, the censorship list. Uh, the top 10 countries are really um, in Europe for the most part. They're um, like the Dutch and Scandinavian, uh, Finland. Those countries usually rank um, in the top. So Switzerland, uh, those kind of countries. Um, I think Germany's up there as well. But America's actually like 40 something on the list. So even though we are the, you know, country of the brave and the free, uh, we don't have the best, um, you know, freedom or censorship, non-censorship, I would say, in the world. But we're also not the worst. So um, censorship, of course, in the U.S. involves the suppression of speech or the public uh, communication. It is protected by the First Amendment, um, but it does not apply to obscenity, which therefore can be censored, and we've talked about that. Uh, hate speech um, is legal as long as it does not incite others to commit illegal acts. And the First Amendment protects against censorship opposed by law, but does not protect against corporate censorship, the restraint of speech of spokespersons, employees, or business associates. Um, and so that's where you can, you know, Facebook can block you or take you off Twitter or whatever, uh, because it is a um, private business and not a um, public one. Not to say that America's in the top 10, but I just wanted to mention that we are not in the top uh, 10 most uncensored, but we're also not in the top 10 most censored. We're kind of in the first third, I guess. All right, so then we have China. So um, China is very censored, as you probably already know. Um, their government controls all of their media. That includes television, print, radio, film, theater, text messages, instant messaging, video games, literature, and the internet. Uh, so much so that they um, have the great firewall of China. Um, their government says that they have the legal right to control the internet's content uh, within their territory um, and that the censorship that they provide does not infringe on any citizen's right to free speech um, and that Chinese officials have access to uncensored information via an internal document system. So if you are a part of the government, you can see things that are uncensored, but as a citizen, you cannot. Uh, Reporters Without Borders often ranks China as one of the most serious um, and worst ranking on the five-point scale. China has historically sought to use censorship to protect the country's culture, meaning that they censor things to protect their people. Um, foreign and Hong Kong news broadcasts in mainland China um, are usually censored out or blacked out during controversial segments. Uh, China has no motion picture rating system, unlike the U.S., uh, but films must be deemed suitable by Chinese censors for all audiences to be allowed to be on screen. China employs members of the government to write for their newspapers. Basically, uh, the journalists are government employees, and they spread propaganda through that. Um, and in China, there are five state religions that are officially recognized, um, Buddhism, Catholicism, Taoism, Islam, and Protestantism. Anything outside of those faiths are illegal, um, and so you have to be careful about how you worship as well as what you talk about and how you consume media. Then we have Cuba. Um so in the past, Cuba was very restricted. Um, all of their books, newspapers, radio, television, movies, everything um, was pretty much banned. 
However, in recent years, um, that has come down a little bit. They do have access to the internet, but it's very limited. Um, and the majority of Cubans who um, have access or have a mobile phone um, is very rare, and they usually don't have the means to use them or not allowed to use them in most cases. Um, if they do have access to the internet, it is very expensive, and there's a lot of censorship and filtering that goes into that. If you are a foreign journalist in the country, you have to be selected by the Cuban government to come and be a journalist there or to visit. Um, and then, of course, all media is operated under the Communist Party, and they develop and coordinate propaganda strategies through them. Most Cubans are discouraged from listening to any independent, private, or foreign broadcast uh, because they just don't want them getting outside news. And even though most internet access is provided via public Wi-Fi sp spots, um, it is all managed by the government so they can see what's going on. Um, Eritrea is a very, very small country in Africa. Um, and it's usually either in first or second place of the most censored countries. Um, here, human rights are often violated um, and the government believes that they are doing this on behalf of the people. Um, any practice um, outside of their, un their registered religions um, are punished. And if you are, you know, worshiping like that, or if you're listening to anything outside of their submitted media and you try to flee, um, you will be arrested and put into prison, sometimes killed. Besides uh, political opposition, the media is also the target of different resume. Uh, the internet penetration there is about 1%. Um, and if you can get access through a SIMS card to use it, there's usually no mobile data available. Uh, in this country, currently, there is no independent mass media. All of the go government uh, owns the media, and they give out information to the media. So it's very propaganda um, built, and all independent media is banned. And there are only two newspapers, three radio stations, and two television stations. And again, they are owned by the government. This is one of the least safe places for journalists of other countries to visit. Here is where it is in Africa, in case you've never heard of it or never see it, seen it on a map. Then we have Iran. Um, only 17.6% of uh, Iran and Iraq's population has access to the internet. Um, their constitution provides the rights of freedom of speech and the press. Um, but they can basically say that you are going against anything that um, they think is noble and should be censored. Um, and they often um, restrict email through internet chat rooms. Most of the freedoms that they say they have are provided so that the government isn't violating public order there. Um, but anything that um, violates the government, morality, or expresses support from banned parties um, is punishable. Freedoms uh, such as importing or translating media, singing or broadcasting, publishing of other media types um, are all regulated by law, and um, anything is subject to speculation on what is considered obscene, disrespectful, and indecent. So if you have something that's from a foreign country and they decide that something in it is not respectable, then they can um, jail you for it. Then we have North Korea. Uh, so North Korea is usually one or two on the most censored list. All of the media there is owned and controlled by the North Korean government. Then um, the North Koreans get their news from the Korean Central News Agency. Um, and the media dedicates a large portion of their resources towards a lot of political propaganda and promoting um, the personality cult of their leaders and their family. 
Kim Jong-un has absolute authority over all of the press and information that goes in and out of North Korea. Um, the state news agency is uh, pretty old. It was established in 1946 and is still going and is the only one available to the people of North Korea. Uh, the agency publishes um, any views that the government thinks the people need to hear um, and consume. And uh, they speak for the Worker Party of Korea or basically the Communist Party. Um, anything that is published outside of the country is also published by um the Workers' Party, and therefore that's why a lot of the information we receive from North Korea is very limited. Uh, along with being limited, going in and out, um, people are not allowed to reach out and talk to people outside of North Korea. They're very isolated. Uh, basically, cell phones are banned within the country unless you have permission for them. Um, but then if you do have permission, the data is, of course, monitored. Um, all social media and news applications are looked at if you have access to it, but only a small number of people, usually upper class, usually government officials have that access. Uh, but again, it's censored just like everyone else. Um, and most computers that they have there are highly restricted. Uh, a funny note was is that you could get internet if you went to like the state capital there um, or the government capital, but then they realized people could get access to the internet there, so they like cut it off. Um, if you buy a radio television in North Korea, it has um, preset things within it that you can watch or listen to um, and is sealed with a label to prevent tampering with it. If they come into your house and see that it is not a North Korean um, manufactured television or radio or you've tampered with it, then you will go to jail. If you want to become a journalist in North Korea, you have to go to college there. You go through ideology training and a strict background check, and then um, you're on probation for four to five years to make sure that you are um, trustworthy and that you will um, spew out the propaganda. If you are seen arguing about anything or contradicting anything that the government says there, um, that is treated as a major violation of the society and you are jailed. So those are just some of the countries that have um, lots of restrictions and how they play into global media overall. I think what you should really think about when you think about global media is just how much information are we getting from other countries? What information is that? Who's telling us? And how does that play into our perspective of the outside world? And that's why global media is important. Uh, to think about when it comes to media and communication overall.